So you wake up in the morning and you look at your smartwatch and you look at your sleep data and then you check your WhatsApp messages, you get ready while Alexa plays your favorite songs, you're waiting for your Uber and you check out a bunch of YouTube videos. And on your way to work, you even tweet about that crazy traffic. And in just under an hour, you have enriched your digital footprint with over thousands of new data points. I've been on the receiving end of that data. So for the last 15 years, I've worked with several companies to transform this big data into insights so that we can keep or place the right message in front of the right person, that's you, at precisely the right time so that they can make millions of dollars in revenue. And as this data got larger, because you started playing more Candy Crush, we started using sophisticated tools and algorithms to understand you better. You know, I still remember this day when my whole data team comes into my little office, everyone's screaming and it's nuts. They're on the tables, they're dancing, and people from other departments thought these data nerds, I think they hacked the lottery. But no, in reality, it was the first time our mar marketing algorithms had surpassed 90% accuracy rates in its prediction. For data people, it's a big thing. Happy, happy moment. But that didn't last for too long. In just a few months, my manager asked me to let go of 75% of my data team. They were replaced by the same algorithm that they had created. So why are you not firing me? I asked my manager and he said, because we don't have a machine to do what you do. I didn't know how to react back then, but fast forward eight years, machines are transforming the way we live. They are absolutely everywhere. I mean, the algorithms are more precise, they're accurate, they are just helping us do brilliant things. For example, the other day I heard that Alexa can hear you cough and detect if it's something serious. IBM's Watson is doing early detection of cancer. There's gene editing, bioprinting of organs, driverless vehicles, intelligent drones. I mean, we're going to witness some magnificent, mind-blowing stuff. But as a race, what we don't understand completely, our first reaction is curiosity. But mostly, it's fear. And in 2017, when McKinsey reported that 800 million jobs by 2030 are going to vanish because of AI, all hell broke loose. And then soon after, Gartner reported that 1.8 million jobs just by 2020, 1.8 million jobs are going to be replaced by automation and 2.3 million new jobs will come around which will require new skills. And then the popular report, which was in 2030, 85% of the jobs, like 85% of the jobs of 2030 do not even exist yet. Wow. This is a picture of my son, Adi. He's eight years old, and he will probably enter the job force in 2030. And when I see reports like that, I panic. My first reaction is fear. What will Adi do? Is the education that he's receiving in schools today Will that still be relevant by the time he graduates? How do I prepare him for a future that I don't understand? And 10 years, 20, 30, that's not very far. You and I, we will still be active members of the workplace. How do we prepare for that future? AI is already learning at an exponential rate. It doesn't eat, it doesn't sleep, it doesn't have mood swings, it doesn't binge watch Netflix. How do you compete with that? And when you ask people how to prepare for the future, the first comment that we usually hear is, I think we should all learn to code. Hmm. But AutoML, Google's AutoML, is already coding more efficiently than the engineers that created it. So I guess that option is out. And when we look at what experts in AI, like Dr. Kai Fu Lee, when they give the trends, they say that the jobs that are very creative that are complex and that require compassion, those are the jobs that are safe for now. Jobs like managing people, CEOs, scientists, social workers, and that machines are going to augment our human skills, and that's the future. So by that rationale, 
Google's AutoML may have displaced its engineers that created it, but now in the future, these engineers could be refining the algorithms from a social, from an ethical, from a human lens. And maybe jobs like psychologist and philosophy and liberal art majors are going to further refine those algorithms um, to perhaps test the unconscious biases of the creator. Now granted, these jobs don't exist today, but it's very clear that the future belongs to jobs with higher order thinking skills, and which is why experts from educations, uh, educational institutes or industry or uh, even thought leaders like Yuval Noah Harari, they all collectively agree that in order to thrive in the human AI future, we need a growth mindset. We need soft skills, higher order thinking skills like critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, communication, collaboration, ideation, and empathy. That's what truly, truly makes us human. But when the time comes, you'll adapt, right? Wrong. Because the level and mastery of these skills required to thrive in this radically different future, it needs work, it needs time, and frankly, we have run out of time. But this is not a doomsday conversation, this is about hope. So what if I told you that those cognitive learning strategies, what if we could combine them with the very AI that intimidates us to accelerate soft skill development. Could we do that? Would that work? And the answer is yes. And that's exactly what we have been researching at my startup, Cartido. Alongside behavior scientists, psychologists, educators, employers, data scientists from all over the world, we have been researching, can we accelerate the development of these soft skills? Can we measure the development and if that works, can we scale it to empower billions of people? And I want to share with you some extracts from our research. So the first thing that we looked at was, can we speed up learning? Absolutely. And it starts with self-discovery. In order to speed up learning, we need to understand the baseline, the current, the soft skills today, the inherent personality skills, your abilities, your um, how do you learn, for example? Are you a visual learner? Do you learn more by watch, watching a video or do you learn more by looking at an infographic? What are your stress triggers? What are your motivational drivers? And what our research suggested was that most people have a hard time doing this on their own. And even using psychometric assessments, it can give sort of misleading results because they're more aptitude driven rather than behavior. But AI can lend a hand here. It can look at millions of data points and come up with personalized learning recommendations. We're beginning to see some early results of this on our platform. For example, Sarah has a profile. She's a visual learner and she's a convergent thinker, meaning she can synthesize information very easily. But that very trait also makes it difficult for her to do divergent thinking. For example, she might struggle with coming up with lots of ideas to solve a problem. Brainstorming techniques with the visual example is just the thing she needs to move forward. And let's say these techniques require a dedicated 15 minute activity, but with a timer, and we know that it's a stress trigger for Sara. We could remove that and replace it with a creative pause, where she can take a step back, refresh, come back to the activity with fresh thought. The next thing that we looked at was, can everybody learn these skills? Absolutely, and that's what our research suggested, that everyone can learn these skills. It's, it's almost like riding a bike. Everyone can do this. It takes time, but it also needs an open mind. You fail, you fall, you get up, you try again. But the level of mastery of these skills that's required to thrive in the future, now those skills those skills come with a lot of experiential, deep learning, lots of um, experiences that are diverse with unfamiliar topics to speed the process up. Talking about learning to ride a bike, you know, as a child, I never learned to ride a bike. I was too afraid to fall. And <clears throat> as I grew up, I would watch a lot of people ride these bikes. And I would tell my husband, I wish, I wish I'd learned. So out of the blue, one day he brings this YouTube video that promises that anyone can learn to ride a bike with these three techniques in under one hour. Hmm, that was interesting. So naturally I was 
very skeptical but extremely curious. I gave it my all, and 45 minutes later, I was riding like the wind without falling once. And in some ways, what we've done with Cartido is very similar because we speed up learning with techniques. We've also researched that design thinking is gaining a lot of credibility in developing soft skills. So on our platform, we immerse learners in various design thinking challenges, like you would be designing a beverage for the future or designing an empathy manual for driverless cars. And just like riding a bike for the first time, these learners know nothing or very little about the topic. But by the end of it, they're stunned with their own innovation. It's that euphoric moment when you suddenly realize that you're balancing on that bike. The next thing we looked at was can we measure development? Now, assessing behavior and personality is relatively easier, but growth, growth is intrinsic, it's personal. And there's no generally acceptable rubric for soft skill measurement. So we developed our own. We create a baseline challenge where we measure the demonstration of soft skills, and then we track the same variables over all future cha challenges to monitor growth. This is a micro lens where we look at it from an individual perspective. But the next phase of our research is going to be a macro lens. So imagine if the same challenge is being done by people from different countries, say Peru and India, and we notice that empathy scores in one country are higher than the critical thinking scores of another, we can help education systems cross-pollinate to boost the development of these soft skills. We can also pair students with complementary skill sets to boost the skill development through collaboration. The last thing that we looked at was, can we scale this for everyone? There's really exciting work being done in soft skill development all over the world. There are design thinking workshops, innovation activities, immersive learning experiences, but the thing that our research flagged was most of them are in an offline setting, which means that they are either in a workshop format or in person. Now, billions of people are going to get impacted by automation, and this is definitely not a scalable option. Then comes the issue of continuity. During the workshop, your skill development is an all-time high, but when you re return to work or your normal routine, it starts dwindling. And the kind of level and mastery of the skill required to thrive in the future, well, that takes sustained effort, lots of experiences, diverse, and you have to do it constantly. Think of it as your daily mental gym. And the last thing that we noticed was that a lot of rich data and insights are lost because of the offline component. We thought, could we experiment with a lot of students and a lot of professionals, and maybe our solution could solve the scalability problem. I want to give you an example of something very recent. Just two weeks ago, we conducted a workshop on our platform with the top 20 schools in India, with students from the top 20 schools. They were asked to do a design thinking challenge on our platform. Now, these students had never heard of design thinking, and they had a very basic understanding of AI and other emerging technologies. So we gave them a baseline challenge, and their challenge was to design a solution for a leader of the future to make more ethical decisions, fully packed. We didn't give them any instructions. We give, didn't give them any guidelines, nothing, all on their own. This was baseline. And our data revealed some extraordinary soft skills. And it also told us this is, that this entire cohort, they had very similar personality traits. Most of them were convergent thinkers. So like Sarah, they would all need help in coming up with ideas. Next, we made them do the same challenge on our platform, this time with certain learning techniques. And this is where the magic happened. You know, I believe in people. I really do. And I believe in the power of data. And I believe that when you combine the two, extraordinary things happen. And what we saw was that each and every student, just in a matter of three days, had shown a remarkable development in their soft skills. Across the cohort, we saw a 40% increase in critical thinking. Ideation, which I thought would be a challenge because these were all convergent thinkers, that grew three times. And empathy, empathy is very hard to develop because it's so immersed in social values. We saw a 17% increase in empathy. This gives me hope. This gives me hope that there is a solution for us to accelerate the development of our soft skills. Now, 
this is a magical time to be alive. This is the time where we focus on our human powers and use machines to augment them. I don't know in 2030 what Adi would and would not do. But for now, when I pick up and place AI in the palm of my hands and ask, hey Siri, are you going to make me irrelevant? And her response is, I don't know. My response is going to be, absolutely not. Thank you. <laughs>